Hello and welcome to the Build As Well YouTube series. This is season three, episode nine. We've already got the other transplants done, which means it's time to start the autoflower seed. So today is about autoflowers and earth boxes. For those of you that have followed along in the past, we've used earth boxes throughout our series, mainly because they're a really good jumping off point for people who are worried about simplifying growing the organic way, the build a soil way. This makes it automated. It takes away the variable of under and over watering. And when you do it right, it hooks up an incredible amount of horsepower underneath the hood that really opens up the speed of growth and the yield that you can get out of a small container. Today we'll discuss why it works, how it works so well, and there's some natural principles at play. And I think when you're done watching the video, if you've not considered getting an earth box, you're gonna be figuring out, do I build one, do I buy one, what's the best way to go here? Other uses for them, a lot of people put these on their patio and they have an entire kitchen garden right outside where they, they cook. They can go out there, pull fresh herbs, take down some peppers, have lettuce. If you're into that kind of stuff, the tent behind us is gonna be for vegetables. And this is a brand new earth box. If you've been following, we have other earth boxes. We're gonna use those in the veggie tent. We're setting up a brand new one today so we can take advantage of teaching you from beginning what it looks like, what it comes with. There's multiple ways to do this. And when you learn from the manufacturer, they kind of teach you a little differently than the build a soil way. So if you're gonna use living soil in the earth box, I wanna teach you how to do it. Now for autoflowers, they're a little bit finicky. What I mean by that is they, when you grow them, we all know how much a setback can slow you down when you're growing. But the difference with autoflowers is we don't have any time to recover from a setback because they go into flower when they go into flower. Where normally if you have a veg room and you have a flower room, as long as the veg room has healthy plants that are ready to move into flower, there's never a delay. You can always pick and choose from there. You can have an abundance in your veg room. You can have slow vegers, you can do whatever. Uh, you can have one take two weeks too long, as long as by the time you're ready to flower, you have healthy plants. With an auto flower, it's based on the time, not the photo period. So if you're watching this for the first time and you're wondering, hey, build a soil, auto flowers, we've never done auto flowers here as part of our series, but this time I'm getting excited because the breeding's changed a lot since the last time I ran them. Um, those of you might be familiar a decade ago or even longer about the low rider auto flower crosses like AK-47 low, low rider and all the other ones that were popular at the time. They weren't nearly as uniform in breeding. The quality wasn't very good. And a lot of people called them ditchweed because uh, the ruderalis comes from an area where there could be 24 hours of light. And because of that, they've developed a special feature. This type of hemp, this type of ruderalis plant, it acts differently in the sense that when you plant it, it doesn't wait for the sun to get to 12 hours per day or less to start to flower. Normally indoors, what we do is we, we just trigger our lights to be on 12 hours a day. Maybe 13 would be enough, but to make sure we go 12 hours or less, and that triggers the bloom that we're after in a set period of time. Outdoors, flowering can be lengthened because the sun takes a while to go down in time, and it's a beautiful process. But when you live in an area where it gets cold really fast, man, having a longer flowering variety can be a pain because the sun shifts, takes too long, your flowers aren't done, and it's getting too cold. So auto flowers have this unique ability to say, look it, if pollen is flying, I'm gonna flower before it even happens. If it gets cold, I'll finish before that's an issue. So there's always this reason to try and work with autoflowers. And so the difference is when you plant an autoflower, it's based on time. Since the day it germinates, it's on a ticking time clock to when it's gonna start to go into flower, regardless of what the sun does. It could be 12 hours a day the whole time, it'll just do its thing and go to flower. It could be 24 hours of light the whole time, it'll go to flower. Most people agree that 18 hours of light with six hours off is a really good time frame for autoflowers. And I think that's coupled by the fact that we have really potent lights nowadays. And a lot of times running a powerful light 24 hours a day is just gonna be too much light in a day for, for most plants. So the seeds that we're gonna be popping, a lot of you have requested that we do these ones, the strawberry milk and cookies. And it's spelled with a Q. And this is, let's see, milk and cookies crossed to Bruce Banner number three auto. And there are five seeds in here and we only need four of them but I'm gonna plant them and make sure that we have two per earth boxes. We're gonna run two earth boxes. And originally we were gonna run both these earth boxes in the same flowering tent as our normal 10 by 10, but we're gonna eventually go to a 12 hour day in there. And that's gonna happen in the next two weeks or less because we just transplanted and we're not gonna veg very long. So right now we're under 18.6, perfect for auto flowers. So what we're gonna do is germinate these seeds, have everything in the 10 by 10, and they're gonna be under 18.6. 
When we decide to go to flour, the 10 by 10, we're gonna take one of the earth boxes that has two of the strawberry milk and cookies, and we're gonna put that into a special four by four tent that we're gonna make just for the auto flowers to highlight it because Daz was so generous to send these to us. A lot of people question the time, the photo period that we're gonna be using. So to make it fair and also add some observation to this, we're gonna see the difference between one earth box with two of these seeds under 12-12 lighting versus one earth box of two of these seeds under 18-6 lighting. And I'll do my best to make the DLI similar. So in the one that's on 12 hours, I'm gonna have the light really intense and a little bit closer. That way it gets the same amount of light in the 12 hours that this would get in 18 hours. I think a lot of you will find insight to seeing the difference in structure, size, shape, flower, odor, if there's any differences at all, which I expect some. Um, we'll highlight it, we'll talk about it. Next, what we're gonna do, besides the auto flowers that I've discussed, the different tent, 18 hours the whole time, the 10 by 10, we're gonna have one of these earth boxes on 12 hours. They'll both be under 18.6 for the same amount of time until we switch them. Last but not least, I've got a third earth box and they're all gonna be treated the same and I'm gonna plant some feminized photo period seeds. When I say photo period, I'm differentiating because these are normal seeds. They're gonna go to flower based on the photo period when it gets reduced to 12 hours and these will be alongside the auto flowers in the 10 by 10 tent. So these will be next, all three earth boxes will be next to each other. As soon as we go to flower, this one will stay there. One of the auto flowers will stay there. One of the earth boxes with auto flowers will move out to the new tent and we're gonna get a ton of data and learn from this. I don't have any expectations. I've never grown these before, but I will tell you, some of the customers of this company have reached out to us already and shown us pictures of their strawberry milk and cookies and they were ecstatic above and beyond. They were like sharing pictures, saying this is the best auto flower they've ever grown and that we have to grow it and that we're gonna like it. I smoke a lot and in my experience, they just aren't as potent on the head. But if I'm wrong and I really do like them, I will admit it and I will tell you that. But to finalize, the Mountain Trop Forum Girl Scout Cookie Cross from Bloom Seed Company. We ran these last time. I only ran one in a five gallon and it turned out to be some of my favorite smoke, even though it was a little bit finicky in that five gallon. So in an earth box, I think it's gonna crush. To keep the test comparable, we're gonna run two as well. Two feminized seeds in an earth box. And you might be wondering, well, why are you gonna run a feminized photo period seed next to an auto flower? I think these are the two options if you're, if you're shopping this method. In my experience, the reason why I bought auto flowers when I first started growing was, hey, I don't wanna be buying herb from the dispensary. For me, it wasn't the dispensary, it was too long ago here. It would be from the dealer, right? And instead of doing that, you would always want to replace the cost and you're having to invest a lot. So for me, I was like, well, if I buy some auto flowers, maybe I'll have some head stash right away. Like, cause they tell you 60 days from seed or 75 days from seed. And that's just the whole time. That's not just flowering. That's from when you, when you plant the seed to when you harvest. And so because of that, a lot of people buy them and they go, okay, perfect. Now I don't have to adjust the timer. I just plant them and I get my herb. And that's great, but when I was doing it, like one of the autoflowers was like this big and had like an eighth on it. One was like this big and had an ounce on it. And you're like, this is unpredictable. And it was kind of fun for a backyard project to have an early harvest, but I stopped growing them indoors. Now, fast forward, since we're doing this, the genetics will be a lot better and I'm excited about that. As far as the photo period plants, the main reason why I wanna compare this is I feel like when you're better at this and it's been five years, you've done it a lot, you go, Man, I could have just planted these and harvested in 60 to 70 days anyways. There's nothing saying you have to veg for a long time. In fact, you'll, you can look around on the grow farms and find people that flower from seed. They literally plant the seed, put it on 12-12 and just let it rip. And there's something interesting about photo period seeds. Probably the same with autoflower. There's a reason why autoflowers don't go to, go to flower the day they come out of the ground. They have to reach sexual maturity and then they get triggered. Same thing here. If you plant these seeds, any photo period seed, a lot of people think they have to like put them into flower to determine the text, the, the sex, or do DNA testing like we did. But as we've proven in season one, all you have to do is plant the seeds. And in about six to seven weeks, depending on what size container you have and what the genetics are, you'll be able to sell the sex of all of them, even under 24 hour light. It has nothing to do with that. They've just finally reached their sexual maturity. They're showing their pre-flowers and you can identify it. At that point, they're ready to go into flower. So if I were to trigger them into flower sooner, they wouldn't really start flowering. They would be growing to the point where they could start flowering. So when you go 12-12 from seed, you're basically just saying, go to flower as fast as you can, but also grow for as long as it takes. And if your light's really good and bright and you're following the right DLI, they're gonna grow great, go into flower and produce a decent yield. I'm not gonna go into flower day one because it's not time to flower yet. I've got maybe 10, 14 days, which is perfect. 
That'll give these just enough time to get about that big with a few leaves before they go into flower, which seems really small, but in an earth box, by the time the roots hit the reservoir and they really jump and stretch, I think you're gonna be impressed with what we're able to do, throwing some photo period seeds into flower immediately, kind of treating them like they're an auto flower. And then we'll be able to make comparison. Was this a waste of time? Was it better to grab auto flowers? And I think we'll have lots to talk about. So for those of you that have demanded we do some auto flowers, looking, looking back now, um, begrudgingly, I appreciate it. I think this is gonna be really good. That's not what we always do. And I wanna get them germinated. So let's get started right now. I'm gonna do the first earth box completely in front of you. And then I'm just gonna grab the next two and bang it out because it's just the same exact process. I'm actually gonna direct sow them. And the reason why I'm gonna direct sow them, I'm gonna, I'll talk about it when I do it. I'm gonna put the seeds right in the soil in here. I'm not gonna start them in little cups. The main reason I say that is auto flowers, they don't like to be transplanted. And I guess what I mean by that is you don't have these waves of growth. They're gonna go into flower. Part of that is determined by their environment. So if you pop a seed, it's smart enough to know if it's in a little cup, hey, I don't have very many resources. I better go to flower and produce some seed, produce some flower. But if you give it room, it's gonna take, it's gonna gently coax it. The other thing I'll notice is if you have a mom plant that you've been keeping around and it has kind of an autoflower recessive genetic, anything in its background that may have had some autoflower in it, when they get root bound, they'll go to flower, even under 24 hours light. So sometimes knowing they're restricted, it triggers that. So what I don't like to do with autoflowers is start in a cup and transplant, get them slowed down, transplant. You're only working with the, like literally the day you germinate the seed, it's a ticking time bomb. So we want as much explosive growth as possible from the day they germinate. And then you won't have to deal with that finickiness. A lot of people are scared to direct plant into a big bed, but since this is not no-till, it's brand new. It's not like there's worms and row beetles and everything. I can just directly plant right into this. If you've got like a no-till that you're trying to go into, I would say it might be best to make a little space and put like some fresh seedling soil in there and germinate in it, or start in a cup and just transplant before it's root bound at all. Make sure you baby them and just treat it right. So that's my advice. I'm gonna direct sow to avoid the mistake we had earlier in the season. I'm gonna put a dome on here. That's gonna trap the moisture around the seeds and I know that I won't have to water. It's not gonna evaporate the moisture and I'm gonna be confident these are gonna germinate well, depending on the seeds, right? How old they are, lots of different things you might have to consider at home. So let's get started. I've got Build-A-Soil Light, which is my favorite to use for auto flowers. Along the way, I'm gonna top dress with Craft Blend and I'm also gonna use some Colorado Worm Company castings, the Co-Woco, or I might use some Build-A-Flower. I won't have to go very hard since it's a lot of soil for two auto flowers and the earth box is so powerful. Let's get started. I've got the seeds. I'll set these to the side right now. I'm gonna do the auto flowers first. I've got the two things I'm gonna add to my water. We've talked about these a million times. You can check out those videos. This will help make the water kind of foamy, rich in saponin. It'll make sure that this soil that's in a bag, now these bags breathe so they don't go anaerobic, so it can dry out a bit, and the peat moths can kind of repel moisture. So once we get the soil in there, we're gonna make sure we use the wetting agent to make sure it is evenly moist, no dry pockets. And also in the water, we're gonna put Rootwise Microbe Complete. That'll make sure that we have the mycorrhizae and all the beneficial in the soil to begin with. Because this has been sitting in a bag, although it's a living soil, and we're really proud of it, it's been in a bag. Right, it's not as alive as it could be. And so if we're gonna let nature, like in permaculture, if you just let nature do what it does, you'll have weeds and you'll have stuff that nature puts in there because it's meant to do a job. But if you can put something in every niche that's possible, you'll have what you want. And nature will still create an ecosystem. So we're gonna put beneficial bacteria, mycorrhizae right away in the soil. That way we start to establish what we want. So those are the two products. I'm gonna get the water set up first because right away I'm gonna need to moisten the wicking corners, which we'll talk about and I'll show you what I mean. This is a wicking system, so it pulls the water from the bottom and we wanna establish a good connection so that it doesn't fall apart. And I wanna have my moisture ready, so I'm gonna add the root wise. You can see there's a little bit of foam from last time I was just watering earlier. That's from the Kuyaha, that's from the saponin. And so that's what helps kind of stick and make sure all the peat moss stays moist. Now, I like to add about a teaspoon per gallon for initial inoculations. And so that's what I'm gonna add in here right now is about three teaspoons, okay? This is an eighth teaspoon per gallon. Now, I, a lot of times I have a bamboo stick. I didn't grab it, so I'm just gonna use the shaking wand. Okay, now that's three gallons. Three gallons is enough for me to do more than 10% on each one of these earth boxes. They're gonna hold 
about seven and a half to 10 gallons of soil. I'm not gonna have them completely full because I wanna be able to come in there and mound craft land and worm castings and all that stuff on top of it. And that'll make a big difference. So for now, we'll show you how much soil we put in here and I'll guesstimate on the water because I don't know how dry it is in the bag, but we'll talk about it as I go. Okay, so I've got the earth box. I'm gonna take, this is how it comes. These are extra. You can buy these if you want. I like using the wheels because it gives height where if the water drains, it's not sitting in its own water. It breathes underneath and they're easy to roll around, but you don't need them. They're just an extra expense. A lot of people literally just set that on the ground and it's totally fine. In the bottom, you can see there's holes that are already pre-made for the wheels. So it makes it super easy. And this is all food grade plastic. And I'll tell you, these last a long time. Um, Colorado sun is super intense, high in UV. All the used ones that, I've, that we've had down here as part of our 10 by 10 series, they were like on my property in the sun for five years before I brought them down here and they look good, they work well, they're not brittle. So very, very impressed with this. I've made some do-it-yourself ones from Rubbermaid tubs and they fall apart, get super brittle in the sun. They're not food grade plastic. It saved me a couple bucks in the beginning, but cost me a ton in labor. And these just work better. I really like the size of them. Some people don't like the shape because they think, well, it's kind of rectangle. Do you have like a square one or a round one? There is power to the shape and I'll discuss it. If you want to fit four in a four by four, you just put them around in a circle and they fit really well. Otherwise three fit perfectly. The shape is that it is the soil sits on top of the screen, which we'll discuss, but you can tell there's only this much volume of soil. So it's more of a long, shallow amount of soil and that root system will follow that. And that's what we want. We don't want something tall. And part of the reason why is I just don't like tall containers. I think the earth is, you know, like the top layer of soil where the plants grow, the top six inches. So they're gonna put the root system far out, not as deep down as one might think, especially on an annual plant. And so with that in consideration, that makes a lot of sense. But here's the second part. We are gonna have a reservoir of water underneath here. And the water has to wick up. There's no pump in here. The pump is gonna be the plant's roots. It's also gonna be the pressure of the grow light and the heat and the soil and just osmotic pressure from the moisture contacting the peat moss, the pull on the plants, and it just moving up, almost like if you put a paper towel on the top of a jar of water and put it down, it'll literally siphon all the water out. There is that wicking effect that happens. And so because of that, imagine if it's this tall, that's a lot more pressure to move heavy water all the way up here from just a natural wicking effect. Wicking a lot of times would work easier down. So this is shallow to help maximize that wicking effect. The, the taller ones that I've used, they didn't work as well. I have to top water as well. It became kind of finicky. So the shape works really well. I just wanted to hit that right up front in case you're wondering why this word rectangle, it works. So that's part of it. Let's deconstruct this. This is the food grade plastic shelf that it comes with. It's got holes in it because your soil is gonna sit on top and your roots are gonna go in here to the reservoir below. Much like nature, there's oftentimes underground aquifers, streams, rivers, all sorts of ways that plants connect to water that's under the ground, not just on the surface. And so it absolutely makes a lot of sense to be doing the underground, the sub-irrigated. They call this a sub-irrigated planter, also known as a SIP container. So if you're gonna look on the internet for how to build your own or maybe to buy one, SIP container is a great term to look for. Global buckets, earth boxes, there's a lot of ways. People will make them out of Home Depot buckets and put their own little wicking system in the bottom, but that's a taller one and I don't think they work quite as well, okay? I like this shape the best. So this is the next thing it comes with. It comes with instructions, it comes with a feed tube. The tube is where you put the water in. And so if you look, this shape here is cut out in notches. It's got a notch here and a notch for the tube. Okay, but this notch is for the wicking corner. And if you look in the bottom, this is the reservoir. The reservoir has an overflow. And that's what I mean about being new to this, how it can mimic, uh, mitigate the over and under watering problem. If you put too much water down the tube, it's gonna dump out the bottom of the reservoir. So you can only water the proper amount. And then you'll see it running out the bottom. If it's in your grow tent, you could just shop back it. Some people, they'll actually put a little catch tray right here. And if they overwater, it just dribbles into the catch tray and they just dump that out. So lots of ways you could be clean and organized here. There is some two corners here that are protected by a barrier. This is where I'm gonna build a wicking corner. And when you put this in here, you can see that that exposes the wicking corner. I'm gonna pack the soil in there and I'm gonna pack it very tight. You could put cocoa core in there. You could put whatever you want to act as a wick, but I found just the regular soil you're using works perfect. There's no special reason to do that. And the only thing I do is I make sure I put the soil in, I pack it as hard as I can, and I get it pre-moistened. 
the main consideration there is if I just loosely put it in there, fill my soil, put my plant, and then water down the bottom, that initial rush of water, it could just wash out a loosely packed corner, and then your soil's in the bottom, you have no corner, and there's no actual solid contact to wick. Don't overthink it. If you follow what I'm doing, it's just gonna work. But that's something that I want you to be cognizant of so you don't mess the corner up if you're just like, if you're just running and going at it and don't think about it, okay? Mulch cover, it comes with it, it's in the tube here. There's a white side and a black side. But people go, this plastic, it's like a shower cap. I mean, why are we gonna use this? I've done it where I keep the soil a little bit lower and I put the straw in here and I have cover crop and they work great. I mean, they really do. But some of the horsepower of having a smaller container is the ability to mound compost and craftland and all the goodies up here and have worms in it and the whole deal. And I tell you, when you put this over it, mulch is mulch and these are reusable. So the mulch that we use will slowly decompose into soil. And it's straw, but the straw just covers the soil surface like skin. This does the same thing and it allows the wicking to occur. It keeps it nice and moist and it blocks it from the light. So it's doing the job of mulch. The only thing it's not doing is decomposing and turning into new soil. Well. This goes so fast, we don't have time for it anyways. It's a very small amount of mulch in here. It's not a big bed. And so just putting compost and putting amendments will give you the breakdown that we're looking for. And the unique thing here, when you use this mulch cover and you're, you're doing the earth box and you have it top dressed, you'll be able to peel it back and literally see white fuzzy furry roots eating the top dress, just, just fully like everywhere in there. And that's unique. Normally if you move the mulch, it may not be so. This just creates a very good system, so I encourage you to try it. You can try it both ways, but I think you'll agree with me. The mounding and the keeping things moist and the roots under there happy and the worms happy, it has its place. You, if you have some panda plastic, you can just tape that on here. You don't have to use this, but this is like fungi and it makes it a little bit easier. So that's what we'll be using. Finally, from their instructions, is talking about the watering. And I believe it goes into detail in here, but essentially they tell you to just keep the reservoir full. I don't like to do that. They tell you not to use compost. And I think that's why they don't have any issue keeping it full is they use like Promix. It has none of the biology of the compost. It's a lot lighter weight. When we keep it completely saturated like a swamp down here, it can go anaerobic. So the method for build a soil, I'm going into detail. I just really want you to know how to use an earth box, okay? The method for build a soil is not to bottom water until the plants are big enough. They immediately send roots to the bottom. So it happens pretty quickly. I mean, in the first week you'll be bottom watering most likely, but the first few days, don't bottom water. We don't want anaerobic soup. It's gonna slow down the growth. We're just gonna get the moisture right as if this was a regular container and just pretend it does not have the sub irrigation. Once I see the plants are explosively growing and it's likely that the roots have now, the first thing plants do is they put roots to the side and go down. They wanna determine the new space they're in. As soon as this, these plants start growing and they're a little bit bigger than babies, that to me will signal the time I'm gonna start watering down to the bottom. And here's the thing, the first watering, it might last a week to 10 days. Eventually after that, the plant starts to drink it so quickly, I might be filling it every day, especially with two plants in here. But what I don't do is I do not fill it until it's bone dry. And I'll, I'll talk about that as we grow. I, I normally look down the bottom, if I see a reflection, there's still water. As soon as I see no reflection, I know it's a hard plastic bottom, then I'll add more water. That ability to keep the moisture of the soil from being excessively moist comes from the fact that as soon as you put the water in, it's touching the soil all the way up against the screen here because it's full. And then the plant starts to drink it and it gaps and there's an air gap there. That air gap is between the soil, the roots can hang down now and it's wicking in the corner. That gap allows flow of air through this system here, constantly keeps air, that stops it from going anaerobic and it allows compost the build a soil way done in an earth box. Only trick is you have to let it go dry between waterings. Some people say they don't, and I'll tell you, you can get away with it until you can't. Occasionally you'll have a plant that grows just a little too slow, it wasn't quite ready for a bottom watering, and then you kept it full the whole time and it'll literally just 180 and die on you. Completely root rot out and just ditch. So that's the worst case scenario, and you can completely avoid that by just doing what I told you to do. You know, there's always exceptions to the rule. Somebody might be able to keep the reservoir full when it's hot out and they've got big plants. But since we're auto flowers, they're special to us. We don't want to mess it up. We're going to top water in the beginning. We're going to bottom water, water later. Okay? I've explained everything. That's like the whole deal. I've got enough talking. Let's get this thing set up. I'll put the wheels on, but you don't have to use these, okay? That's it. Two of them have a lock. I don't care. I'm not like on a patio that's angled. I'm not ever going to use the locker. 
but if for some reason you're going to use the locker, you might want to put one wheel on each side or each corner that has the lock so you can lock both sides so it doesn't start to roll away on you. We're in a level surface, so it doesn't matter to me. This is the lock, so it'll just lock the wheel so it won't roll, okay? Got my earth box, moves around wherever I want it, nice and easy. Okay, I've got this in. Now the next thing you need to do, don't forget, I've done this before, it sucks. Put this in. I get excited, just pour the soil in, and now you gotta dig it all back out because you forgot to put the tube in. So you put the tube, and it literally just rests right there. And like, it's flimsy, it's fine. You're gonna put soil in there. The soil's gonna hold it. It just needs to go down there, so don't overthink that. Okay, here's the soil. If you've used our soil before, you notice that it has a different bag than everybody else. We found out a long time ago, when we send 60 bags on a pallet to a gardening store, the bottom bags get torn with those stretchy plastics. And so we went like a feed bag, and our soil is more than twice the weight of most soils, so we needed it. And then I'll reuse these bags around the house as a trash bag, or I'll store soil in them, or amendments in them. They're great for a lot of things, and they last a long time. Right away, I can see the moisture on this is acceptable. It's not bone dry or anything, um, but I'm definitely gonna have to add some water to that before we germinate these seeds. I'm just gonna dump a little in. Make sure we focus on the corner. Okay, so that's enough for me to get the corners wicked. I'm just gonna go in here and pack this down. Now there's extra soil here. I'm not trying to pack that. I don't care. I don't wanna like force it through the screen. I'm only worried about the corner, making sure that it gets tight in there. And then I'm gonna add some water. The whole idea is if water gets rushed down here, I don't wanna just wash my corner out. So I'm making sure it's nicely packed. And when the little water hits the bottom, it's not gonna get washed out. So that's about all I need to do. Now I'm gonna make sure it's moist. The main reason I do that is that'll glue those corners together. I'll do some, and I'll come back. You can see that Kyuyaha, how foamy it gets. That helps make sure that it doesn't just dump water. Like you can see there's no water just running down the reservoir. It's stuck in there, and it's gonna slowly go through to the bottom. Now I'm just gonna take my fingers like this and just pack it down. It feels really good and packed now. So now that's not gonna wash out. The rest of this is fine, it's not in the corner. That'll just be with the rest of the soil. If a few things fall through, you're gonna see down there already a little bits of pumice and soil. Your plant roots will eat that. There'll be a couple bits of pumice. It's not the end of the world. Most of it won't fall through. I've recycled these no numerous times and I'm always surprised to find that it's pretty clean down there. Like, yeah, there's some sludge from worm castings and worms, but it's not all full of roots and soil. It's mostly a water reservoir the whole time. So I'll grab the rest of this soil, it's completely ready. The only thing I don't want to do is I want to move some of the soil around here, so I'm going to get that tipped out. I could just dump it all in, but I'm going to go around here and kind of reinforce around the back side so that this is angled right, and I'll pack down just a little bit so the tube is pretty much where I want. Now that feels pretty good. There we go. Put the rest in here, and you'll see we have room for a little more. So that's why I say a cubic foot a lot of people will roll with. That's about enough soil in here. But I like a little bit more. I mean, that still gives me inches before I'm even mounding. So I'm, I'm definitely gonna put that fourth bag evenly across them all. And that means I'll have a third of a bag each, which will just be perfect. That's about a third of it. I'm gonna build the rest of them and then germinate the seeds. That's it, this is everything that I wanted to see. This is perfect. I'm gonna germinate right in here. I'll move them over here probably and just do all of the other two. I'm gonna just go fast do this exact same thing that I just did on the other two earth boxes. I'm gonna set this down and I'll water it. And then I'll get started with the other ones. So when watering, I only wanna do about 5% would be the goal. One and a third bag, and that's about 10 gallons. So essentially, that's 10 gallons of soil. There's gonna be 10 gallons in each one and it works out perfect. That means that I could put one gallon of water here in the most. I'm probably only gonna put a half gallon because I do not wanna overwater this. I'm just trying to keep the top moist enough to germinate the seeds. Look at all that pumice pop out now with the water, beautiful. The other thing you can do is kind of take note of the weight. Okay, that's what it feels like when it's empty, has a little bit of water in it, mental note. I've got two more to build.
good. I just finished watering all three earth boxes. And one of the things that I did that was important, which you might be excited to plant your seeds. I want you to wait just a few minutes. The moisture's moved through here now. It's made a nice spongy-like material. Right when I was done watering, it was still kind of wet up here. It hadn't seeped in into the soil. And so the last thing I want you to do is just put a whole bunch of water, immediately start putting your seeds because it's still gonna be like soup moving around just a little bit. Once it's settled in and it feels nice, you're ready to go. The other thing I wanted to do is just do a little dig test. I'm gonna go over here and make sure that it's moist down deep enough. So I'm finding moisture all the way till about the last inch it starts to get a little dry. That's perfect. That means that I haven't overloaded it with water. But here's the other thing that's important. If I only get the top inch moist, that bottom dry portion is gonna slowly pull that moisture and make it even. Nature likes balance. Biology learned about passive transport and all that stuff. I just feel like nature's balanced. And so it's not gonna just stay wet on top and dry on the bottom. It's gonna be evenly kind of half dry by the time you're done. So at least make sure you've got moisture most of the way down, if not all of the way. Then you're not gonna have the dry portion of the soil pulling the water out of the top and drying your seeds out. I'm feeling confident that this is the right level of moisture. I put one gallon of water in each one of these. And since there's 10 gallons of soil, that took about 10% volume by volume. So um, yours, if it was a little drier, might actually take slightly more than 10%. If it was slightly wetter, it might be a little bit less. The good news is pretty wide margin to hit here. Just make sure it's not soup, okay? And make sure it's not too dry for your seeds. Some people, if this was a no-till box, like and it's really active, you could actually dig out a little bit and put some seedling soil in there so it's really gentle around where you're putting your seed. This is all brand new. I'm gonna go straight at it. Now, planning where I'm gonna put them. I'm just gonna go about equidistant from the sides and I'm just gonna make two locations where I put the seed. All I did was dig my finger in just a little bit. I'm not gonna put the seed that deep. I just wanted to show you where it's gonna be. I'm gonna put them approximately in this area. You put them wherever you want. Later when I go to plant, I can mound castings and craft blend all around the plants and they're gonna have access to it and I can actually mound it pretty high on here. The reason why I don't mound in the beginning is I'm gonna top water for a little while and these edges allow the water to hit the sides and go down. If it's mounded, the water hits the top, dribbles off the side and you never get any water in there. So when you're bottom watering, the mound doesn't water or doesn't matter. But in the beginning, I like to top water. So let me fill that back in. When you're planting seeds, the, the size of the seed, I'll show you, that's about the depth you wanna go. You don't wanna go five times as deep as the seed. It's gonna be really hard for the seed to get out. Other side of that, if I just set the seed on the surface, it could potentially dry out, but let's say it doesn't. The seed's not really anchored, so now it's gonna send a taproot down and try and grow up, and it's gonna be just falling everywhere. So you have to get it in the soil enough to have a strong seedling that doesn't just shoot up all lanky, but not so deep that it can't push through the soil, okay? So that's something to think about when you're direct sowing. I'm gonna pack this down just a little bit. I don't want the water that I add to kind of wash out later, so I'll do that on each one as I go. But right where I'm putting the seed, I'm just gonna press down so it stays firm, just like the seedling cups that I do. Now I'm gonna get the seeds out, and let's see here. This is the, this is the one, the strawberry milk and cookies. I'm gonna put two in here, and these are the brown earth boxes. Both brown earth boxes are gonna have the auto flowers. The green earth box are gonna have the uh, Mount Trop cookies photo period plant. There's the seeds, it comes in a pack. When you're opening these, just be careful because it's kind of hard to get in here and you don't want to fling the seeds everywhere. Sometimes they'll stay there. See that, how it's stuck? Oh, there it goes. I just did what I didn't want to do. So the fifth seed that was in here just jumped out and I'll look for it and grab it. All right, be careful. I was trying to show you it stuck to the foam and it fell in the soil. I had to dig around for a second and I got the seed. So here's the fifth one right here. To plant the seeds, all I'm gonna do is try and push my finger in. Don't worry about the pumice too much, but I'm just gonna put it about as deep as I mentioned, set it down. Now, here's something I don't always talk about. There's a direction to the seed. And so it's hard to see on here, but there's kind of a bottom where all the whole seed comes together and you can see like a knuckle on the bottom of it. At the top, it comes together perfect. At the bottom of the seed, it kind of has a knuckle on the bottom where it all comes together and you can see it's a round nodule there where the top slopes together. A lot of people know that the seed opens like this and it opens where it's slender to the top. It cracks and opens like uh, cracking a pistachio, right? How one end is stuck and you peel from the top. Same thing here. So a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll get smart and they'll take the seed and they'll put it in perfectly upside down, thinking, aha, so easy for it to open now. Where if you put it upside down, the root has to go like this and then it has to lift through the soil. But one of the cool things is when you actually plant them upside down and the root does go like that, it self removes its own seed hole when it stands up. If you put them on like this and they just shoot straight up, it has its cap on and it stays on there sometimes for a while and you have to pinch it off. So what I like to do, because I can't always get it perfectly upside down, is I put it sideways. 
when the seed is sideways like that, now I know the root can go out. If the seed is sideways now, instead of like this, we plant it sideways. Now the root goes out one side and then it stands up one way and it's pretty likely that it's gonna pull its own seed hole off and it's gonna have a deep root so it won't just be all finicky and falling over. A lot of times it's the light that you use. Some people use too weak of a light on seedlings and they get tall and lanky. But another reason is because they just barely plant them and they just kind of shoot up and they get a little bit like wanting to fall over until they get some, some uh, structure to them. So that's sideways, it's right there. Last I'm gonna come up and I'm just gonna tuck it in. That's it, that's where the seed is. I'm gonna go do the next one right here. I'm gonna put it sideways, it kind of falls sideways usually. And then I'm just gonna tuck that in there. Now, I'm not worried about these drying out this time because I'm gonna use a dome. I could have cleaned the dome better, but this is what I used last time. Just set the dome on there and I'm gonna make sure it's wiggled into the soil so that not air is going underneath. And I'm gonna close these. Now it's gonna be nice and humid. And even with my grow light hitting here, it's not gonna dry the soil out. It's gonna stay wet underneath where this dome is, even though it's clear. It's just gonna get all condensated in here and that's gonna keep it perfect. And literally I will not have to touch that. I'm not gonna have to water it or do anything to it until those seeds germinate. If you have seeds that take, sometimes they take five to 10 days to germinate, it's really rare. You might need to pop the dome and throw some water in there to get like a flush of water on to get the seeds to pop, but I try and avoid it. The only thing that I do do before I put the dome on is one last bit of moisture. And the reason is right where I put the seed, even though I packed it, I want it to kind of like congeal right onto the seed. And the seed, it's designed by nature, its only job at this point is to pull moisture and literally wicking it into the inside so that it can open and it's very good at it. So it just needs to be moist in the area and that's it. I'm just gonna hit it from afar so that I don't dislodge the seed. Okay, that's it. I'm gonna put the dome on. I'm gonna keep planting the rest of the seeds. I'm gonna label it even though I know what they are. There we go, okay. I've got a third seed here. I've got a fifth seed, I should say. You know, it's not often that you get 100%. Nature just doesn't operate that way. And even if you have really fresh seeds made by a great breeder, you know, 90% might be more likely. When you buy vegetable seeds, even if they're from that year, they'll do a germ test and put 89%, 95%, 99%. Rarely would anybody claim 100%. This is nature we're talking about. So since I happen to have this extra seed and it's possible that one of these won't germinate, I'm just gonna put an extra one right in the middle so I know it's the extra. And maybe if I need it, I can just dig it out, put it where the other one that didn't germinate was. When you're doing tomato seeds, you just usually put two per hole. That way for sure you get one and you just pull it out. But when you're dealing with expensive seeds, you just hope that it works. Beyond hope, I wanna make sure that I have enough so that fifth seed, if should any of these holes not pop, hopefully that does and I can move it to that location. So we'll find out, I'll put it right there. Night Owl, thanks Daz, we just planted your seeds. I think they're gonna explode out of here. I know we've talked about organic soils for autoflower specific. I really think this will work well. But maybe we'll learn from this and maybe we can make something a little bit more particular. But my estimation is that these are just gonna crush. That's it. Now, you don't have to use a dome. If you've got some Tupperware, if you've got a clear cup, if you've got saran wrap, I mean, you can literally use anything. We're just trying to keep the soil moist there. Same thing, just gonna press it down so that it doesn't run away on me when I water. These come in a similar pack. I'm gonna be careful when I open them. Okay, I'm just being real gentle when I lift the foam here. Okay, none are stuck. Again, beautiful seeds. I have more than I need for today. These are all feminized. Since I really like these and can take some home and I wanna make sure we get germination of two, I'm gonna put two per side. And then if they both pop, I'm gonna take one home. I'll put them just off center, one there, one here. Either way, it's like pretty close to the middle. So one there. There we go. That way they're not on top of each other. Whichever one looks the best to me, I'll just pull the other one out. Instead of pulling it and killing it, I'll probably take a little bit of soil on the root and I'll transplant it. There's no reason to waste any seeds around here. These are fire seeds. Okay, I'm doing these the same. I'm doing them sideways in the hole. I'm not doing them face up or face down, which we discussed. That's four of them. I've got them in there. I'm gonna mark that I put four just in case I forget for later. Now I'm gonna cover these, just kind of tuck them in. Okay, press them down. 
We just planted all the seeds. That means we're basically ready to go for the season. And I gotta tell you, those Pacalolo ones I've just connected in like a day. They're already taking off out of the four by four. Now that I'm seeing this all happen, I'm taking like a whew, sigh of relief. We made it through the first issue popping seeds. Turned out to be almost nothing. We've got more than enough of all the genetics that we need. Earth boxes and autos, I think are gonna be one of the best things we've done to highlight this for somebody that's new or somebody that doesn't wanna set up timers or just wants to have a flavor on their back patio. And heck, if you guys are serious auto flower growers and that's all you do, hopefully we can show you something different. You know, we don't do this every day. Earth boxes crush, auto flowers and earth boxes. It's like fast and furious. I think you guys are gonna love it. So I've got the earth boxes, we've got them separated. Last but not least, I just literally need to carry them into the tent. I'm gonna let these sit for just a second, kind of congeal, I've got some things to do. And we'll move them into the tent. After that, we're gonna set up another four x four, put in another timber grow light. And one of these is gonna have its entire four x four grow tent to itself with the perfect environment. And that's gonna give us an opportunity to show you how we dial in a brand new environment again. And that's one of the most important things you guys have to do. If you're growing some autoflowers, don't just take it for granted that they're gonna be easy to grow. Right? If we can get the humidity right, the temperature right, the lighting right, you're gonna impress all of your friends. You're gonna have the best herb on the block, better medicine for yourself, and it's gonna be easier the whole way to have healthy plants. You're not gonna be just constantly fighting it. So uh, we'll show you how to do the build a soil way with auto flowers and earth boxes. Watch along. Um, thanks, if you've got questions about these genetics, questions for Daz, I'm sure he'll dump, jump in here and answer some. If you've got questions about earth boxes, I really wanted to make this an episode about the earth box and about setting up the earth box and about the nuances there. So we kind of did, we did a little bit of a deep dive on the shape, on the pressure, on how it all works with the watering. I'm gonna show you how I water going forward, how the reservoir gets dried out, all of that. So watch along. To make it easier, subscribe. You'll get notified of our new videos. And if you're into vegetable gardening, be sure to check out our Build a Soil Family Farms. My wife is running the farm. She does all the work over there and she's gonna be teaching I've also got the veggie 10 by 10. We're gonna teach you how to grow your own food indoors in your garage, no matter what your weather's like. And we'll be using LEDs to do that. Daz, thank you so much for the seeds. And until next time, I'll see you guys on the next Build a Soil episode.